Hey, I'm Chef Rush, and you're watching Hollywood Real with Jay Menez. All right, Chef, thanks a lot for joining me. Pleasure to be here. All right, man. Uh, I'm incredibly honored that you're joining me here today. Not only do I admire what you represent and all your accomplishments, but you know the way you represent the military and serve the charities that benefit the military families. Um, so thank you for that, and thank you for your service. Oh, thank you, I really appreciate that. <laughs> all right, we're gonna talk about a lot of stuff, but first of all, I wanna get it out of the way. How the heck did you get so big? <laughs> so big? Yeah, your arms. Uh, eating. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I eat a lot. Well, they eat twice as much as I do. Uh, I know I've always been in health and fitness my entire life. Uh, as soon as I could walk, my dad put me to work. Uh, I was from Mississippi, small town. I, when I say work, I mean hard work, not the little work. Uh, you know, lifting. He did construction for 50 years. Uh, so it was kind of like that that given to go and do stuff. My dad told me to lift a car and put it over there, I would do that with no questions asked. It wasn't about, I can't. There's no, I cannot in my vocabulary. <laughs> wow, okay, so how was your childhood? I had a wonderful childhood. I mean, it was uh, extremely, uh, well, it was, I, I guess I can say it was the best of times and the worst of times. Kind of like the military, kind of like life <laughs> in a lot of perspectives. Uh, I was um, I was different because my my mother taught me the naturing part of of, of who I am. That's why I, I give back so much. My dad taught me the hard work aspect of life. I mean, when I say hard work, it was a lot of times where I had to work, and other p the kids went out and played, and you know, even with my football and track and and working out, I had to go and work. So in the beginning, it was kind of like okay. You know, I want to be a kid. Now I look back at it, I'm extremely grateful for the way I was raised. I, I love it because I can give back to so many more people with that, um, with that aspect of it. Of course. So your dad instilled that discipline into you of at course. a really early age. What did he do? He did construction for 50 years. When I say 50 years, he retired after 50 years of construction. And that was when we didn't have the big machines or, I mean, some, he would, I can put people to shame right now with what I do. He would put me to shame at what I could do. Wow, so he was a big guy too, huh? Uh, he was a big guy. I mean, the endurance part of it. So that's kind of like all those things. I want to be that guy who could run the farthest, jump the highest, lift the most, not in a competitive way, just my nature way. Yeah. Do you have brothers and sisters? I do. Five sisters. Uh, one uh, colonel who's in the Air Force. Uh, my brother was an uh, officer in the Navy as well. Another one was a uh, merchant marine. Uh, my other sisters, uh, educators, um, teaching the blind how to read and, and, and adapt in life. And then another one was a psychiatrist um, and a social worker. Hmm. Do you find yourself competing with them a lot? Uh, no. Didn't have to. <laughs> I stood alone. I mean, it wasn't a never a competition. My my younger sister uh, in there's a huge gap between me, my younger sister, and then the rest of the family, which was eight of us, uh, maybe like 13 years. So when I was a kid, they were already going into thinking about what their next career is going to be. All right. So what drives you today? <sighs> what drives me today, people. People, inspiration, motivation, uh, intestinal fortitude, selfless service, self-motivation. I mean, I have so many things that drive me that even I didn't know. I, I knew they did, but not in the way that I do now that I can lend an ear or a voice or a hand or some type of support. Um, I tell people all the time that, you know, I feed off of positivity 100%. Uh, negativity, I feed off it a thousand times more because there's always going to be more negative in the world. And people say, no, my circle is just positive, it's small. And I say, that's not true. It is because you're going to have to go outside. You're going to have to talk to someone who's going to get under you, and then you're going to lose it. I got that. I have that passion where I understood myself, and I had to realize that there's going to be negative. So I need to figure out how I'm going to utilize it to my advantage. And I have. Yeah. You know, you're, you would live such a life of service. Were you always kind of that value-driven kid? Or, or did, was there an event that happened earlier in life that led you to that? Um, no, I was always that 
that type of way. Um, because of my mother. Like I said, my mother, my, my dad was, <coughs> excuse me, my dad was a little harder. My mother was the type of person who, when I was a kid, would bring the homeless off the street and sit them at our table and, and feed them. And, and I used to wonder, why is this person who's dressed like this coming in? You know, everybody else was shunning them away. And she set me and my uh, sisters down, the family down, and said, hey, this is a person, or they have X, Y, and Z, and from there, I, it just opened my eyes, and instantly I, I, I changed the way I looked at their situations and X, why, why not? And, and uh, of course, I was always put in, even in the military when I first came out, I was put in, was thrown into leadership roles. So I had to learn how to adapt. And luckily, because of my background of where I was raised, and it was a small town in Mississippi, believe me, only a few people, and then to go out and see so many different um, religions and ethics and, and just, just a whole smorgasbord and rainbow of different cultures was just kind of fascinating to me. And I wanted to understand each and every one. So what came first, your interest in uh, cooking or the military? Uh, cooking was my passion first. Mm -hmm. Cooking was my passion first. It was a hidden passion, actually, because like I said, my dad was a pretty hard man and uh, my mother would cook. And I would sneak and go cook with my mother, basically because I like to eat and grab a couple of little things of food. But uh, after a while, uh, she would teach me little stuff. And I was secretly, she would secretly let me cook some stuff. And uh, and and, it, and I was on a farm with my dad a lot. So we used to have to go and, and pick vegetables or pick fruit. And when I was a kid, and I, I hated it. And I remember it was so dirty and, you know, I wanted to go and play. and. And one day I realized when he was, he'll call me Dre. He was like, Dre, pick it up and eat it. You know, it's in the dirt. I'm like, I'm not eating this, it's in the dirt. And fast forward, uh, you know, a few weeks or a couple months later, you know, I found myself arbitrarily going in the dirt, picking up a, a tomato or whatever it was and just like, and, and tasting it. And, and I remember that taste, the sweetness, you know, how vibrant it was. And I, I look for that taste profile now in things that I do. And that's what I want. I don't care about, of course, my stuff is fancy and it is great. Don't get me wrong. But I also look for that comfort of how I felt when I was a kid, when I bit into an apple or, or asparagus or any, any kind of fruit, cucumber. It didn't matter. Just the juiciness and the freshness from it. Wow. Yeah, it's amazing what, what fresh, fresh fruit and vegetables can of course. taste like, right? So what led you to the Army? Uh, I think it was a path. Uh, it was funny because my brother was in the Navy. Um, my sisters already were doing their education thing. Uh, and when I went to the Army, I didn't tell anyone. I didn't tell I was going to the military. I didn't want anyone to, to try to influence my decision. So I had an art scholarship, I had a football scholarship, I had a track scholarship. I was scheduled for the Olympics for the trials because I held the records in 100. Um, and I said, I want to go and do something that's bigger. Didn't know what it was in the military at the time. I just knew, like I said, it was a small town and it wasn't about getting away. It was I wasn't in trouble or anything of the sort. I just wanted to be part of something that was bigger. Didn't know what, or how, or why, you just take a risk. So what did that look like for you? Was that just going down and signing up with a recruiter? Uh, that was <laughs> uh, having a bunch of recruiters fight over me, actually, which was pretty um, different. Uh, you know, I was the Marines, of course, the Army, then the Navy, and and school was a, a big influence with a lot of the guys for recruiting <clears throat> and the Air Force. Um, at the end of it, <clears throat> It was just one guy talking to me, just saying, hey, X, Y, Z is not going to be the best. It's not going to be great. Instead of just throwing me fluff. And that's why I'm so real with what, in world talk. I don't like fluff. I like it how it is. I like transparency. Just tell me how it's going to be. And I respect it a million times more instead of trying to tell me what I want to hear. Of course. Was it always the Army for you? Was it always the Army? Yeah, or any other branch were you considering? Oh, no, um, Marines, Marines. I had a lot of friends that were in the Marines, and even a lot of, I've worked for Marine generals, and they were like, you should have been in Marines. Mm. I said, well, I'm working for you, so I am in the Marine. <laughs> so, and, and that's like on my platform, you never hear me talking and saying that I'm in the Army. I always say joint forces, because me working for so many different people in high profile, whether it be the chairman, Secretary of the Army, Defense, uh, at West Point, even the White House, I, 
I love my branch. I love the army. You know how people say, oh, I'm a Marine, I'm a, I'm a devil dog, I'm a this, I'm a that. I say we are joint forces because I go and I talk on platforms for Army, Navy, Alpha, Marine, which I'm extremely grateful for. They don't scrutinize me and say, well, he's an Army guy. We're not going to let him come over here and talk for us because we're Air Force, you know, or vice versa. I mean, I get it. I love my pride and so forth. But if you see me talking, I want to know that I love my service, love your service, and, and troop form will we'll do a, a friendly competition when the Army, Navy game comes. But at the end of the day, we are all one. You had pretty an, an incredible career in the military. Um, but from when you went into where you started working with the Joint Chiefs, uh, tell me about that career what, in the middle. Like, did you go? What job did you go in as, and how did you rise so so far so quickly? <sighs> Hard work, um, luck. A coincidence, <laughs> and then a lot more hard work with that luck. <laughs> so you know how somebody can you know take you to the door, you knock on it. It doesn't just open for you. You have to fight your way in. And if you do get inside, you have to make sure you can stay inside, and you got to make sure your worth is worth it. <clears throat> for me, uh, beforehand, <sighs> my career was extremely hard, even for the people that I work for and how I work for them. I mean, because I did give up a lot. I gave up a lot, but I received a lot more, you know, with that time, you know, you're talking 100 plus hours a week of just just grinding. And then you talk about all the different things. I mean, Iraq, Afghanistan, you know, even from 9-11 uh, in the Pentagon when the plane hit, um, I, I reflect on all those things and I look back at them and uh, I wouldn't change anything as far as my, my job and profile, no matter how hard the work was, because, and I'll be very, very transparent, like I say, I always am, uh, the military is, is, is great. Some people in the military, not so great, <laughs> you know, but that's, that's life. That's any, any job or what you do. Some people are going get, to get intimidated you and say, hey, you look better than I look. So, you know, I don't like you. Or some people are going to say you're working harder than I work. So I don't like you. Or some people are going to say you work hard and I like you. and I want you on my team. I've, I've looked like this. I'm smaller now, you know, unfortunately, which you guys mentioned. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, I have... <laughs> so impressive. You, you, you hit a threshold. And it's all the same. <laughs> it's all the same. It's funny because I have gotten uh, high-profile jobs because of the way I look. I've lost high-profile jobs because of the way I look. <laughs> so it's each his own. <laughs> yeah. It, it can't be just... Uh, what you look like. What do you think it is that they saw in you that really uh, made the difference? Well, you know, uh, I'll be honest again, you know, people, sometimes when people see me without me saying one word, and it's human nature, you're, you are, your, your mind is, your, your brain is programmed to automatically uh, judge or prejudge them. When I say that, not in a negative way, you can say they're great or they're nice or they're this or they're that. But if I'm this guy and you see me with a tank top on and and I don't say anything and I may have a, you know, a little friend, you're like, whoa, I'm staying away with that guy. Yeah, I'll give you an example. I was in an elevator uh, at a hotel and I walked in and there was a little old lady who was right in the elevator with me. And she she was in the corner. She said, I I'm not going to lie. I'm I'm scared of being here with you. <laughs> and I looked at her and I smiled and I said, ma'am, let me tell you something. I said, if there was a bad guy in here, I'm the one person you would want in here with you. <laughs> you know, you know, and uh, she laughed. I laughed. And that was the end of it. That's going to be part of what it is. But People will look and they'll kind of prejudge you when you, well, even with me on my platform, when I came out and people were like, ah, oh, another, what do they call meathead or jockhead or whatever and so forth and yada, 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 yada. It, it, that's all it was. And, you know, with the, 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 the talks of uh, steroids or whatever, I don't know, because I don't do them again. But after I opened up my mouth, and they learn what I'm about and, and what I'm doing because it is about selfless service. And then to be able to reach so many more with the same message is a blessing. But uh, like I said, it, it's, it, it's embedded. It's, they see you and now you have to sell yourself, right? It's kind of like wearing a tie. You know, even with me, you see me where people ask me, why do you wear your chef jacket all the time? And I said, well, I look good in white. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is I have many degrees and 
the thing about my shelf jacket is it reminds me to be humble. It reminds me of who I am and where I came from. You know, you don't have to see me in a suit and tie in front of, because if I go and I do uh, elite or I do the kids, you'll see me the same way. And a lot of people, even the higher echelon, they ask me, chef, can you wear your chef jacket? And which I appreciate, but it also reminds me of let other parents or people in mind that your son, your daughters, they don't have to be the lawyers or the, the pilots or whatever. They can be the garbage man and still be just as impactful. The, the, that has nothing. It's about the person inside and how they want to do it and how they give and how much they give. Anybody can have my platform, like your platform. They just need to know how. And if they do get that platform, they have to understand that it's not always about them. Where do you think you struggled the most in your military career? Hmm. Where do I think I struggled the most in my military career? That's a loaded question. I mean, it's so many different. Uh, well, let me <clears throat> let me put it this way. Was there ever a moment that you thought of quitting? Quitting the military or quitting yeah, just just giving up like I'm done? Um, no, there's uh, like I said a long time ago, no was not in my vocabulary. Uh, quitting is um, quitting is something I, I I, I can't be that uh, practice what you preach guy saying, doing the exact same thing that I'm preaching about. Um, there are times that I've been down. There's times that I wanted to find my belonging. There was times where uh, I was by myself. There was times where, you know, anxiety or, you know, talk about PTSD, which I don't do a lot on my personal experience because I, I try to get people to understand, a guy like me with my size, that I'll have a situation or issues, like many others uh, before me and after me and, do, and now, we have things and I'm here for people. I'm here to support, I'm here not to bring you down. And if I do take you on a ride or a story, my end result is to bring you up and uplift you. To let you know that you see me, here's who I am. I'm laughing. I'm, I have guys all the time uh, ask me, Chef, how do you do this? How can you communicate openly in public with all the scrutiny? Because don't get me wrong, as many times as you see and people think, oh, Chef, I want to be in your place. And I say, no, <laughs> you got to go in my DM and see all the hates and see all of this and see all the taunting. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. People don't understand it. Now you have to be tactful and know how to handle that. And you have to know, like I said, the negativity. You, I have to know how to feed off of that. But I also need to know how to articulate that back to each and every person, especially the kids or someone who may be at the bridge of being suicidal or depressed or anxiety. And just today, I've, I've gotten 100 people who said, Chef, thank you, thank you, thank you. And my response is, thank you back. Thank you back each and every time because, like I said, again, it's not about you. They feed off of me and I feed off of everyone else exactly the same way they feed off of me. So uh, quitting was never anything. But PTSD, of course, is real. Uh, and it is something that people individualize go with. And us as influencers or as people or individualize or whoever, we have to understand and know that uh, we are that first link. Right. We can we can and words hurt. You know, one of my things is about bullying, anti-bullying, bullying. Like I said, I talk to a lot of kids. If you see the suicide rate with teenagers now or even in the military, active duty it's over the it's off the chain. And people ask why, why, what happened? What's what's going on? You can't just push a bunch a bunch of money into it without understanding the logistics of it, of why and words can save lives, they can also end lives. And that's the thing, especially now with social media, which I love to death about it. You can, your reach could be astronomical. I mean, I've been featured in 50 different countries and I'm humbled by it from Japan to Africa to India, Budapest and so forth. And I love them to death, right? And they talk about a message that I delivered that may have started off with my 2,202 pushups or my 24 inch biceps, but ended with positivity. Why do you do the 2,222 push-ups? Because I'm a beast. That's <laughs> some joke. <laughs> See, you have to have humor along with this. I <laughs> because, <judge> <laughs> because, you know, you sometimes you'll go crazy. But it also, um, I do the 2,222 uh, because of 22 Vets Commit Suicide a Day. Um, 22 Deaths Commit Suicide a Day, active, active duty right now, uh, is leading at highs as being since the war for active duty suicides not veteran, past veterans, 
<clears throat> and that's a big deal, you know, not to account for because the military, they don't take records for spouses, for kids of suicides. They don't do any of those records. That's just for active duty veterans, so forth and so on. And I caveat with a 2,222 because I don't want to just make it about the military. Spouses, like I said, the kids, someone who may need help, someone from abroad, you know, different countries, anybody for any reason. And it doesn't have to even be suicide. It could be cancer. It could be any cause that you want. Like I said, people say, Chef, you're doing too much. I say, I'm not doing enough. I can have a thousand causes and it still wouldn't be enough. And I will give you 100% to each and every cause that I do, anything that I talk about. I'm doing some for, for pets coming up, which I love animals. I am absolutely love them. I'll be out there advocating for the animals, you know, for, um, you know, sex trafficking. For any, It doesn't matter what it is. The only thing I say to people is, which is is my thing is don't make it when it happens to you to be that much more impactful. When someone in your family has cancer, now it's a really, really, really big thing. You know, support each and everything alike. I mean, to you, to your means that you can do it for. But um, uh, me, I, I'm just I'm going to keep doing what I do as much as I possibly can, and I'm appreciative of what I can do. What more can we do to uh, help prevent suicide? I understand it. Knowledge is power. Uh, suicide is, it, it has a stigma that comes with it, especially with, when you say PTSD. PTSD has this with the military, you're crazy or you're out of control. And sometimes in media, it gets twisted that way. Like he was crazy or, he, or she was crazy or, or anything. <clears throat> we are the first line. You know, if someone says that I may have help, take it seriously or look for signs. A lot of times you won't even know what they are. I, one of my soldiers, uh, if you heard uh, in the past, he committed suicide literally on my watch. Uh, he was 23, 24. And I love him. Actually, I kind of vicariously advocate for him as well. Um, young guy, great smile, laughed all the time. And we, I remember having a conversation with him about suicide. And he kind of laughed like, man, that'll never happen to me. I'm, I'm, I'll never do that. Wife, two kids, and, and it happened. Um, the one thing I will say to people is treat everyone like you would want to be treated. You know, people with suicide or people who commit suicide, you know, they'll call them cowards or they want the easy way out or so forth. I mean, like I said, words can hurt, words can change people's lives, or you can just kind of be humane for a second and lift someone up instead of trying to attack them or attack him or her or try to say you're better than this. And if you're gonna say you're better than this, say it in a way where they are better than this, where you're better than this, to understand. Look for signs and don't just send someone to the 800 number. Of course, that is the way to go for the suicide, but don't just say, hey, call a number. Right? They're not going to do it. Yeah, there's no empathy it, in that. No, there's no empathy in that. It's not going to happen that way. People just think, well, I gave him the number. You know, come on. Would you give your kid the number and walk away? Would you give your mother or your father the number and just walk away? And I say that put yourself in that person's position, no matter how big he or she is or how little or how hard you thought they were in the military or how many people they, how many deployments they've had or so forth. And I've talked to so many different people, an array of people from everything from the suicide to just saying, chef, I want to quit because I don't want to go in the gas chamber. And I say, really? <laughs> Why? Let's go together. <laughs> and I will show you why you shouldn't quit and give up a lifetime of gratitude and service of things that you, may happen that you're not even aware of. And even when talking to people with uh, that, I, I don't tell them that they're going to affect their families and so forth. They're going to affect the future because they can have the future president. They can have the, the kids that they're not had yet or could do. And you change so many. You change. It's the butterfly. You change so many courses of life when you do that. You don't know what happens when you don't. Yeah. What are the telltale signs? Like, wh what can we take from this conversation if we have a friend, colleague, anybody who may be exhibiting those signs or feel depressed? What Are there telltale signs that we should look out for? There are some telltale signs. Demeanor. Uh, habit changings. Uh, if they did something every day for the longest time where, you know, one of the guys said, right before his um, grandfather committed suicide, the one thing he did differently was 
every morning he would kiss his wife. That one morning he didn't kiss his wife, right? And to me that was, okay, I don't want to kiss her because I know what I'm going to do. And if I did kiss her, it's going to be that, you know, things like that. I'm a very um, observant person, so I look and everything. And I kind of over-criticize, or over-analyze so many different things that people think I'm kind of crazy about it, but I have to because it was my lifestyle and my job. Uh, but it could be, it doesn't, it, if a person smiling and laughing and he won't know, but sometimes you need to just ask the questions. What's, what's going on? What's wrong? Oh, I'm okay. It just kind of absorb a little bit more. Look at it over the days. Don't just look at for that one second. Look over for right then and just kind of take a step back and say what is happening with him or her. Or even the kids, especially with the kids, because it's they can be, especially if you're not on that level, they can be, be very erratic anyway, uh, just because of society and peer pressure and this and that, which is not even uh, uh, not the best way to be. But you get it. And I think that just giving them your time and your presence and your, your heart to to listen to them, um, not necessarily even giving advice or anything, just just somebody for them to. To talk to is is very very you know can make a big difference. No, I agree one hundred percent. And complimenting people all the time. I tell people on my post, uh, and I'll put a post up, and I'll say, say hello, say something. <laughs> Don't act that way. <laughs> it's Monday, you know. And then you get a million. Good morning, chef. Good morning, chef. It, 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 saying good morning or smiling at someone is the biggest thing in the world. In DC, uh, it is like. Um, I don't know. It's like it takes a miracle for someone to even speak to you. And I'd be like, hello. <laughs> They'd be like, oh, my God, I'm sorry. <laughs> but if that's what it takes, like, oh, you scared me. Okay, well, say it, say it, pass it forward, pay it forward or whatever. <laughs> so uh, you just say something, do something. And not only to strangers, but in your household, you know, whether it be your spouse, your girlfriend, your kids, you do say something uplifting. Text them. Say a little text thing. Do a voicemail. Make it different. Don't just go off that... Um, just get habit changing type of things. Something when I say habit changing, meaning that I'm seeing a text, say hi, oh I love you, I'm thinking about you, or have a good day. You know, change it up and say, man, get up, <laughs> let's go to the gym. Man, get up, let's go have some meat or something that'll just pick someone up. That's great advice. Yeah, tell me about your charity, Two 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 Inc. Your foundation. Uh, yes, Two 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 Inc. Uh, is a charity uh, foundation I started, uh, and I did that because. Uh, with the kids, uh, to, um, and you have to give me a, because I always, everything is two, 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 uh, together, um, together to push, to serve, um, too many, right? And, uh, is military coming together with kids, which the kids are deprived, low, maybe, uh, um, nonverbal disabilities, uh, in a hard situations, but the military guys go and they talk to those kids and it's kind of like a win-win where the kids look at them, which they do as father figures, influencers, and in their uniforms, out of uniforms, because they, they're, like myself, they are inspired by them, motivated by them. And with me personally, every time I've been with kids, it's always uplifted me. So I have military guys, men, women, whoever, go and they talk and they uplift the kids and they give them direction. They do mentorships. We do classes and demos and, and it's gonna be a lot more for it. But uh, it's been so rewarding to me just to be out with the kids. And, it's, and I understand because I've been in the fire. Sometimes when we go to therapy, which I've been, the first thing military guys ask the therapist is, have you been to war? Have you been here? Have you been there? And their answer is no, right? Well, you don't know what I'm going through. If you have a six-year-old kid in front of you saying, hey, mister, you've been to war? You're not gonna say, have you been there? The <laughs> first thing you're gonna do is just your heart's gonna melt. And you're gonna either, you're gonna pacify because we're, nat we're natural nurturers. We're no males, females, so forth, when the kids, and even if you have a kid that is, you know, adolescent that's 15, 16 years old that may be on the wrong path, and you can go into that mentorship or that being that, that father figure or that bro big brother where you can kind of change their lives. Not kind of, but you will change their lives. 
And I've been able to talk to about 10,000 kids a year in so many different levels and so many different, and it has been the most rewarding, most grateful thing that probably I've done since I've been doing this. That's amazing. Well, keep on doing that. Thank you. I will. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to run back to, uh, we had touched on an incident at the Pentagon, 9-11. Uh, I understand you were in the Pentagon at that time and got injured. Tell me about that moment. Um, that was a moment. That was a moment. Uh, that was a day that uh, the world changed. Uh, completely and uh, it won't go back. It, it's forever changed from that day. Uh, I lost uh, some friends and uh, that I call family and that's the day that um, um, a lot more happened. And you know, you would have to, um, that's, that's kind of also the time when the country came together as one uh, everybody went straight to the military recruiters to sign up and say, we want to give our part, we want to do our part, we want this, we want that. And it was extremely humbling and overwhelming. Uh, and every year we reminisce on that day. Um, but the thing about it is people have to understand that day is every day. It shouldn't be just that once a year. We shouldn't come together once after something so catastrophic happened in the world, you know, like with the Australian fires, even the fires here in California, we're coming together. We should always be that way. And um, sometimes we need the reminder. We, we, we need the reminder. We do, you know, and sometimes it, uh, unfortunately, you know, 365 days, 364 days is a long time to remind us to go back to it. Um, and, and, and that's why if, even if you see me on my you know, social, and I, I do it. I probably overkill it with, you know, the togetherness or, or doing it that people might get sick of, like, okay, chef, we get it, we get it. Kiss each other, <laughs> you know, hug each other. Yes, do it, damn it, that's what I say. <laughs> um, but as far as 9-11... Um, Where were you in the building at the time? Uh, close by. Um, it, was, it was close. Did you get knocked down, suffer injuries? Um, yeah, it's a little, some stuff happened. Any PTSD from that? Um, I, 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 PTSD, yes, I do have PTSD. I've, I've had it for a while, and that's one of the things that, uh, um, one of the things that I, I do highlight, but I don't highlight, um, along with some of the other things, and, and to each his own, I try not to overwhelm people, and I don't, it, it, this is not a pity party for me, hmm. um, and I don't feed off of um, I don't feed off of sorrow uh, sympathy. and sympathy, or you know, I, I, and I'm not saying that, that anybody else does. I'm just saying that just because of my demeanor and who I am and where I've come from, if you always see me, I'll, I I change up so much. You'll see funny videos, and then you'll see this, and even when I talk about things so serious as far as suicide and prevention, I make light of it mm -hmm. and I make light of, of it because of the comfortability with everyone else because I've seen so many people become uncomfortable when you talk about it but then if you line it up or even with me they see me and I'm talking about it, I'm like you know you need to xyz and they're like you know and it just kind of that decompression comes around and even with 9-11 uh it was extremely serious uh even to this day it, it brings uh um emotions to me uh, it, no matter how many times it's, it's, it's spoken or it's talked about, uh, you know, with flashbacks and, and things of the sort. Uh, and it's one of those things where each individual has to overcome in their own way or together in a group setting with like-minded or people who have it. Even sometimes that doesn't even happen. Mm -hmm. Even sometimes a lot of people, they just want to go in a corner and just be by themselves, right? And, and that's where you have to be very strategic on that part, even if you were in that same corner, about how to address it, because it can get better or it can get worse. What lessons did you take from that experience? Uh, freedom isn't free. <laughs> I mean, to take life for granted. And here in the United States, America is the most wonderful place in the world, but it's also the most entitled. It's the most ungrateful. 
Uh, and it is the most everything. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying this to be controversial or anything. I'll say it about myself. Sometimes I'm entitled and sometimes I'm ungrateful. But I say because of now that we need to stop and just say thank you every day and look at someone, you know, I'm going to meet a guy after I leave here who had his leg blown off and I meet another guy who had his leg blown off. And <coughs> I was telling him yesterday, I said, you know, he, he made a joke and he said, if he gets down or something, he pulls his shirt off and looks in his pre looks in his chest, and he's like, ah, I'm I'm good now. <laughs> I guess he was thinking he's sexy or something. <laughs> but <laughs> that's the way we have to look at it and laugh, you know. I said, well, I look at you and I, I get happy, and it, and it goes away. Um, but we just really need to just take a step back. Sometimes I'm not gonna lie, it, it becomes overwhelming to me when we take the, the smallest things for granted. And sometimes I, I have to turn off the news and I'm in the news a lot, you know, or sometimes I have to uh, just turn my head because I don't want to hear everything negative all the time just to get like a like or a view or to get, you know, this whole thing. I, I get it. I got it. I understand what it is about that, about content and blah, 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 whatever, whatever. But at the same time, when I go outside and I see little kids yelling at, you know, old, older, their elders or, you know, walking over, stepping over or hitting people, hitting women. And it's just, it's so crazy to me to think about back in the day to now and understand because it's just as simple. And I say that's where it goes back on us as men, as women, as parents, as leaders, as uh, providers to, to make it much more knowledgeable on that aspect of it. I mean, we should be happy that we're here. We should be entitled that we're here. We should be entitled for everything we have. And if you think that you're having it hard, turn on the TV. Go to some, go to YouTube, <laughs> go Google it and look at hardship. Go to Third World and think about what it is. And no, you weren't born there, so it doesn't happen to you, but just have some type of empathy to life. And maybe by then it'll impact you to do something where you can change someone else's life or many people's. You know, especially if you're living in this country, no matter what your circumstances are, there are people across the world who would, would kill to be where you are. I don't care what your circumstances are. You know, if, if you're healthy and uh, you've got somewhere to lay your head, um, you've, um, you're, you're very blessed. True. So, all right, let's switch gears a little bit. I want to talk about um, your White House chef experiences. How many presidents have you served? Uh, well, I've been there back and forth for the last three plus administrations. Any war stories over there that you can talk about? <laughs> <laughs> Many war stories that I can talk about. <laughs> <laughs> At least not on camera. <laughs> I got it. I was, <laughs> um, tell me what presidents, what their favorite dishes are. You know, I, I, it's, it's funny you said that because that is the number one question that I get. Uh, so in 2000 and, um, 2021, uh, me and my partners were actually opening up a, um, it's called the White House Museum. A lot of people don't know it. It's in North Carolina. I don't know if you ever heard of it before. The White House Museum mm -hmm. in North Carolina? No. So it right. has a, the, the largest memorabilia of a White House uh, memorabilia in the world. Uh, so the old Walter Reed, uh, that's in, uh, where, um, that was Walter Reed, the one that was controversial that held us thing and now they moved it. You remember Walter Reed? Walter Reed, it's in yeah, Maryland, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, right up D.C., yeah, right in Maryland, D.C., uh, Walter Reed. No, no, that's the new one in Maryland. Okay. Walter Reed was the old Walter Reed, the huge Walter Reed that they had when the war was going on, they were bringing everyone back to that, and it got shut down because of the conditions. So we actually are taking over that Walter Reed, 100 acres, and we are putting a replica of the White House there, right? We have 235 bedrooms, and I'm going to have Hail to the Chef, a restaurant that is going to have all of the past, every last past president's favorite meal. And I'm also going to have a gym that's going to be there, and it's going to be on 100 acres. But uh, it's funny because I tell people, I say, you want to know what the, the favorite meal, and it's going to be from that era. So however it was in that era, because we have all of the recipes and all of, from every president you could possibly think, well, every president <laughs> that you can think of or their favorite meals and, and things that they uh, kind of uh, liked and didn't like, which you'll find extremely interesting. Can you give us a sneak peek? A sneak peek of the... Uh, uh, Obama's favorite. 
Oh my God. Uh, so uh, he was extremely healthy. He, he was, <laughs> he was healthy. Of course, she's uh, even more so, uh, with the garden. Um, and, uh, basically anything from everything has vegetables, uh, love vegetables, uh, love chicken, um, different types of ways, whether it be, um, uh, forced or, and, and we had kind of like the freedom of do, doing things. So I'm, um, Olympic chef, meaning that I've done a lot of competitions, ACF. So I, and I also have a, a, a cookbook that's actually coming out this year. But we do different types of meals. So not like the comfort meals that you'll see. It's kind of like it's a lot of meals that take a lot of a lot of time and preparation for. So I can I can tell you, you know, whether it be in a French cuisine or the uh, Italian um, infusion type of deal, but. You'll have to see it to understand it. <laughs> <laughs> what do you like to make the best? Um, my favorite thing is what I haven't created yet. I do everything. I love everything. You know, I'm a sommelier, of course, with my wine. I love, I'm a pastry chef. Uh, I'm a chocolatier, a master ice carver. I just love everything about food. Food was comfort to me, and it was also extremely fun. I could, I could, and it was also one of my coping tools. So I started this thing with guys with PTSD, where uh, cooking to cope, meaning that I would just give them a mystery basket, and that was kind of like, um, that was their therapy, and they brought in their their wives, their kids, and it's just a whole fun thing. Let's talk about success in your life. What, uh, what tips would you give to people? What are your three best tips for success? Uh, never give up. <laughs> no is not an answer. And keep going. Uh, I mean, I, I can give you a million different things. I, I say that because it's kind of like what my mom used to say to me on my, and which is why my coin is, is with her. Because there's many times that you'll, that no, people will tell you no a million times. I've been told no so many times that is is pathetic or ridiculous. The probably last time I was told no was yesterday, and I'm like, okay, <laughs> it doesn't phase me anymore because where that one no is, or that ten no's, or even a thousand no's, you're gonna get that one uh, yes that's gonna overwhelm those thousand when it looked like it was just obsolete and it just has no. If it's your passion and it's what you're gonna do now, if I was on a strategic level, I'm gonna say to you, do your research. Do your research. Don't think because you have, I'll use cooking as an example, don't think because you have your grandmother's best pie recipe that is going to be the best pie in the world because you're from the Midwest and that's the only people that understand that concept of it. You want to bring it around and or whatever. Do your research, try it out, uh, and, and don't get discouraged by anything or anything that you do. You know, have like-minded people around you which is one of my top ones as well. You have to have a team that's exactly, when I say like-minded, doesn't mean they need to think like you, but they need to be on your same team. <clears throat> that's one of the hardest things that I've had being me and doing me. I fired everyone because I'm not monetarily driven. I understand that, but at the same time, you have to understand that I'm doing things for a cause. It's not for that to each his own, but for me, I have to, I have to wean out people with negative energy and we're not vibing, I can't be around you. I don't care how much money you're gonna make me or how much this, how much that, which is terrible to say, but it's just true. And I've, I've proven that so many times. I've walked away from things that people are like, chef, do you not know? Uh, no, I don't wanna work with you at all. I just don't, I can't. You know, my my heart, my intestinal fortitude, my, my, my <laughs> nothing, will, nothing will, would make me work with you, just point blank. Uh, and, I, and 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 again, to each his own. You do what you need to do for you and your family and so forth. But if one door closes, there are going to be other opportunities that's going to open. And and when it happened to me, I was like, man, did I just do that? Did I think about that? No, I didn't think about it. It it was the past tense. I don't worry about what happened then. You know, I, I've had a million things bad that's happened in, in business. I've had people steal money from me, big money. I've had partners that I've known for years steal money. I had this and that, and you know, and I haven't recouped it, but I, I say, you know what? I'm glad they did it then instead of now. So you look at the positive side of it. Yeah, that's so important to surround yourself, people, with the kind of energy that, exactly. that, that you want to put out. Some people would say that there are people in your life that you can't really cut out. Family, close family, uh, those sort of people. 
Um, how do you deal with them? Oh, I cut them out. Here's the deal. You know, you you can't. I, don't get me wrong when I say this. I love my family, even my friends I've known for years. <clears throat> I'm gonna support you from a distance. You're not coming here. So the deal about me is my circle does. You people are like my circle is getting smaller and smaller. No, my circle is not getting smaller. My circle is getting bigger because I'm getting bigger. And it's pushing all that negative energy out to let in for that positive energy that's just like me. And if it's family, if it's friends, it's what I have cutting out people in a heartbeat. I've tried in the beginning, and people will try to drain you dry. You know, whether it be because of your cause, if you're so inspirational, I've had it, like, oh my God, he's, I got something that you, could, you need to help us with this, you need to help us with that, and blah, 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 blah. I get it, I got it. You know, you. <laughs> In the beginning, again, I used to try to see if I could save the world. Now I'm okay with sacrificing one person for a million, right? Meaning like, I'm gonna give you an opportunity. Are you coming or not? I'll ask you three times. If you're not, I can't stay there with you. I have to move on because that one person may stop me from helping 20 or 100 more people. Mm -hmm. So that's just the way it is. That's life, you know, <laughs> that's nature. But even with family, if, if family drags me down, and know that because of family, like you've changed. Or you, I'm like, no, I haven't. I haven't changed at all. I'm actually I'm more open and more giving. No, because you just a new family. And no, I'll talk to you later. And later means way later. Mm. Only by text. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic advice. <laughs> and, that's, and that's not horrible to say because it's just nature. It's life. It happens. You know, and that's not me being crude or rude or anything. I love my family to death. I mean, I put it like this. In, in the last five months, I lost my mother. I lost my father. And uh, I lost two of my aunts all at the time. I lost my father, uh, what, f uh, five weeks ago? Five weeks ago. My mother was uh, a few months before that. Um, and that was a testimony for me. That was my biggest trial. And when I lost my mother, long story short was, I lost my mother. I was with uh, Gary Vee, and I was doing commercial, and he was looking for seven inspirational people. And you know he has a big audience, and I was one of the guys he chose for that. And I got a call that says, from my sister says, if you want to see your mother live again, you need to come and see her now. And I was like, what are you talking about? What do you mean, see my mother live again? I get off, I run, I go and see her. I get there Saturday. My mother was 60 pounds lighter. She couldn't walk, she couldn't talk, she couldn't, she couldn't get up, she couldn't, she had a feeding tube. I cried like a baby. I was like, what is going on? The go back was my mother for the last like months, I had been on the road like 25 days out of the month. And every time I call her, every time I say something, uh, my sister would talk and she would just say, keep going, keep going, you know, keep doing what you're doing. Or my sister would tell me for, for her. I was like, oh, your mom, she's, she's tired right now, blah, blah, blah. She was dying and she didn't want me to stop. She knew she would leave me messages. The last time she left me messages was like, Andre, I see you on the, on the Facebook. I love you. God bless you, you know. And that was my last message from her. And that was months prior. So I didn't think about, think about it because I saw her, you know, six months prior. And we were talking and walking and, you know, yada, yada. I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm this guy. I'm being so successful. I'm going to buy my mom this big house like every man's supposed to do. And I want to do all these things for her. And I get there Saturday and she's in a bed dying and I'm crying. And I leave the very next day on Sunday. And I said, Mom, I'll be back the next Saturday. Next Saturday. The next Saturday was my anniversary of being Chef Rush again. And it was also the day my mother died. Mm -hmm. The following Saturday, one week later, was my mother's birthday. And she was buried. Sunday morning, I wake up and I'm overwhelmed with calls. And I was like, I don't know what was going on. I'm thinking people calling me about my mother, you know, saying passing, burying. But then it was overwhelming. And all of a sudden, 
people were calling me, calling me, calling me. You know, I'm getting requests from different countries and so forth. And I had went viral again, like big viral from Reddit to all of this. And then I'm like, what the hell has happened? And it was from something that was, oh, and I was, and I was so upset. I was so upset because I couldn't warn my mother. And I mean, it was like crazy. It was like millions and millions and it was all over the place. And by the time of that day, I was, I was losing it. And then I stopped and I looked up and I smiled and I said to her, I said, you did this, you did this. And um, it was her saying, don't stop what you're doing. If you stop, you're going to stop. And it was, very, and it was like the, the most uh, <laughs> uh, craziest thing in my life, I swear. It was like it was unreal because uh, it happened. And uh, right after that, I, uh, I got this coin made memory of her, of her words that she said to me since I was a kid. And, and I swear to you, I, I live off of that. You know, I say how you take a, a negative and turn it into a positive. And when I say a negative was that once I realized that she did do that. She was like, because there was no way in the world from how it happened to what it happened and the exact days the way it happened that that could actually be true. And uh, I just said, okay, mom, I'm not gonna stop. And when I said that, I buckled down and I said, let's go. And, and ever since then, I just keep going and going. And my blessings, I've never, I've, I've done everything just organically, 100%, with no help, no, I mean, people support me, but I've never had to get anyone to reach out or do anything or, and I just do it from my heart. And I say that humbly from my heart, meaning that I just do it regardless. If I can, I mean, I spent over a hundred thousand dollars of my own money just to support so many people that couldn't. Was that dumb? Of course it was. Was it great? Of course it was. I, I get it. I got it. I, can I do it now? No, I can't. But at that point in time, I reached millions, millions, millions with a positive message. And that was from my mother. You know, if it comes back, good. If it doesn't, I don't care because the message is done. The legacy is there. And I'm I'm content with that. My kids know what I am. And, and I just embedded that and forced that into them and with them. So. Yeah, I love how you um, recognize the light in that situation. I I, um, I sadly lost my dad last year also. Sorry. And, um, and, and even through all that, that's quite a fresh wound for you. Um, how did you... How do you process that even today? Because you, uh, there's really no signs of it. Um, you are, <laughs> like you said, you you uplift every room that you walk into. <laughs> you're so joyous. You're, um, you know, you're grateful. Um, and I cry. <laughs> I cry a lot. You know, I mean, people are like, oh, no, behind closed doors, I release. Which is not a not a and not saying it's a, a, a cry of, of sadness. It's a cry of joy or happiness or things. And sometimes I just I cry and I laugh and I'll laugh to my mom. I laugh to my dad. Because like I said, they hasn't been long, and uh, then I'm good. I'll go. And I'll sit by myself for a minute, whew, and that's the way I decompress. I meditate. I cry, release, and then I start all over again. And when I start all over again, it's nice and fresh. And then I need to spread that energy to other people. And so that's what I do. And I appreciate it because, I mean, even from walking to this room, all I felt was from everyone that's here is just energy, positive energy. And I love that because I have a, a like a nose like a, a greyhound. I can smell <laughs> stuff that's not positive. And it's so overwhelming to me because it's like embedded in me like, I guess I've been in politics for too long. <laughs> joking, not joking, not joking, joking. <laughs> but, uh, we won't go there. You, we won't go there. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, you can you can feel energy. You can feel positive, and people don't understand that who don't know who's not in connection with it or understand it. Uh, that you can feel, you can know. It's like the first time I went to Eric's gym. I was like, whoa! It just overwhelmed me, and I had I wasn't even around the corner to see anybody yet. I went in. and I was like, man, I like this. I like this, and that's why I got a place here now. 
because I love the positive energy. I love that whole demeanor of it. And it's so much to do. And it's 2020 and we're going to do it. Yeah, I think that's a value that you and I share. I think we share a lot. But just um, having uplifting, positive people around us um, that, that share our energy is so, so important. What other characteristics do you value most in other people and yourself? Um, work ethics. You know, you have to have the work ethics. You know, like I said, it's like-minded, like-hearted. I mean, I'm not. I'm always the hardest worker in the room. You know, like I'm the 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 the, the push-up guy. I'm always. I work. I mean, and it's the most terrible thing is do. I only sleep two hours a night most of the time, or all of the time, which is terrible. I'm part of those one percenters that is a functional insomniac or whatever, uh, which is not great because I I counter it all the time and. Hopefully I can I can defeat that, but I've been that way for so long because of my job profiles and the things that I've been through. And and we get a lot of people like me that that has that thing. But luckily my body, again, and I, I can I contribute that to my meditation. It can still develop the muscle growth. And I mean I don't look like I'm 90 years old or anything like that. But uh, um, I, I I I have to feed off of uh, I have to feed off the things that I can feed off of. I want to talk about that for a minute, your health routines. Well, you and I are doing an event together along with uh, Eric the Trainer and Chef mm -hmm. Serena, and that's uh, really centered around healthy habits, fitness, nutrition, um, mindset, and philanthropy, most importantly. What are your daily routines? Daily routines as far as? Your morning routines. When you get up in the morning, do you, do you, do you have a ritual that you do? When you wake up and then when you go to bed at I, night? I, I do. So I wake up at uh, 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, I meditate for about 30 minutes. I uh, roll over in the dark alone uh, and do my push-ups. I do the 2,222 all at one time. It takes me, like I said, between an hour to an hour and 15 minutes. I do 120. People ask. <coughs> I do 125 each set. Uh, then I take like a 40 to 60 second break, then I repeat till I'm done. Sometimes I get done sooner or later. I probably break the record this year for push-ups just because everybody keeps asking me to and telling me to. But it's just because I'll do it, not because of the record, just just to do it. Um, and then from there, I'll... Um, so you do that first thing. You w open your eyes, yep. roll over, and do push-ups. Yep, we'll meditate, and then I do push-ups. Got it. Uh, and meditation is part of my push-ups, and it's my own meditation for my push-ups. Um, and so I derived that a, a, a while ago. Um, it, are the push-ups themselves a meditative practice for you? It is. It is. And that's why I tell people that's not my workout. That's my cause. You know, I don't understand. Like that's that's not my workout. No, that's not my workout. I don't. I, I, and don't get me wrong. Push-ups has, you know. Uh, um, Huge benefits as far as you know, full body workout, core, arms, upper, back, yada yada, so forth. I get it, got it. Will it develop all of this? No, it won't. Uh, but it will get you toned, and it will get you fit, and it will push you. <laughs> um, after that, I uh, I I'll go in. I'll take a shower, and then I'll I'll eat my breakfast, which is a pretty big breakfast. You know, I eat a lot and because I, I burn a lot. I'm an endurance trainer, so I'll eat my 24 eggs or I'll uh, do my uh, Egg White International, which is a huge thing <laughs> that I have as well when I do my pumps, So, which is equivalent to actually when I use that, it's probably about 35 eggs or so <laughs> in a go. Wow. <laughs> um, and Because uh, I can just drink it all down, which makes it a lot easier. Um, That's amazing stuff, by the way. It is. It is. It's amazing. <laughs> I love it. Um, it's so convenient, and I'm making different types of it. But uh, I'll eat my um, chicken I'll have and have my coffee, and then I get my day started. I'll go through all my emails. I'll do type up all my stuff, and, and then just the day continues on. I'll type out my schedule, and then I'm on the road until the night. And then by the time I get back in, whether it be 9 or 10 at night, I'll do everything till about one o'clock before I go back to bed. It's quite a routine, but I can see why you uh, knock out those push-ups first thing in the morning, because by the time you get your day started, you've already done, accomplished a lot. So I try to do one, I did it one time to see what it feel like trying to do throughout the day, and it was such 
a bother. I mean, it was a hindrance because I'm so, so, so busy. And I realized, I didn't realize how many, how busy I was until I had to do the push-ups. Right, <laughs> because you got to stop and do 125, you know, and then I'm like, I got stuff to do. I got this. I got a call. I got to go here. I got to meet the kids. I got to do blah blah blah. So it's all over the place. Like, nope, I can't do it anymore. And how much do you eat a day? Uh, um, I've lost about almost 30 pounds now, which I'll gain back. Well, it'll be a good 30 pounds. People are like, oh my god, Jeff, you gain you 30 pounds? Like, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty light right now. I mean, I'm only like 265, to going on 270, but. Uh, um, and I can control my weight. I, I know my body. That's the one thing people don't understand if they just try to gain, gain, gain weight to get as big as possible. It's redundant if you can't do anything with it, if you don't know how, because your body goes into that survival mode. And, that, and we'll talk about that in, in a, yeah. <laughs> when engaged. But um, I eat about 10,000 plus calories a day. Is that uh, clean calories or does it not matter because you're burning them so quick? Uh, they're pretty clean. They're pretty clean. Uh, I do do... Maybe, let's say, when I say junk calories, let's say about 10 to 15% of junk calories, right? I don't mind having fat in my diet. I don't even mind carrying around here because I have to store it because I lose this so fast. So my, my stomach is solid. I don't have to work out on my stomach, but if I do, it just burns really quick. Do you have cheat days? Uh, every day is a cheat day. <laughs> <laughs> when I say that, meaning that I'm a little different as far as I know my body. You know, I've studied a lot of different things from the kinesiology, nutrition, and then body screaming, you know, eating for your type, all those different things. Personally, people need to, I mean, I, I love veganism. You know, I've, I've done vegan meals. I'm an expert at that. Uh, I, I love all the different, so many different diets and, and, and fats out, and I call them fats just because there's so many of them. Uh, but... I can eat whatever I want. Some things I just don't like. I mean, I'm not, you're not going to see me eating a bunch of pastries or a bunch of, you know, just junk, junk, junk stuff because it makes my body reject it. It makes me feel ugh, yucky. You know what I mean? Even though it tastes great. And even though I'm a pastry chef, I just can't do it. Um, and I learned it a long time ago because when I was doing pastries one time, I cooked a bunch of cookies and I probably ate out of every batch, I probably ate like three cookies out of every batch. And it was all night. And I probably had eaten maybe like a few dozen cookies in one night. And all of a sudden I'm looking at myself and my skin starts going up and down. And it was like aliens or something. It freaked me out. I ran to the emergency room and it was still going up and down. I was like, oh my God, oh my God, I'm thinking like. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he came in and shouted that you had an allergic reaction to the sugar. And that was enough to say, okay, I'm gonna chill out with that. <laughs> <laughs> So sugar sensitive, huh? Sugar, yeah. Well, after a, a few pounds of it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess anybody would be that way. Yeah. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> All right. Tell me a little bit more about uh, how we can support your charity. Um, supporting a charity uh, is, you know, of course, donations or even if the donation is with your time for the military, uh, inquire about it, ask about it. Uh, it's for a wonderful cause. I, I try to keep it as... As tran I don't try. I keep it as transparent as possible of what the needs are of the kids and the military. And it doesn't even have to be military. It could be first responders or anyone that's involved with it. Uh, I look at I look at the military or first responders as those um, public figures, or, or even with celebrities or even public figures like myself, uh, going in and is giving 100% tentative support and obligation to the kids from. I mean, from preschools to kindergarten, from nonverbal to disabled, uh, to just, you know, uh, just kids that really need that support system this day and age to try to give back. But at the same time, it's giving back to those military personnel. I'm doing an event this uh, Monday in Vegas uh, for a few days with about 4,000 military personnel that's in that arena that's been in uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, big sponsors that's there. Uh, that's actually helping me support them also uh, going in. So I, I love the idea about the military and other people getting involved with that. And and this is 100% going back to the kids. So I, I, and, and, I, and don't get me wrong, I still support all the nonprofits or the 501s that come to me that I vet out and I will give them and continue to give them my support along with mine. So, and the thing about that is not all about me, it's about the right organizations that are doing the right thing all the time. Right, because they're not all equal, huh? Ex they're not all equal. Yeah. Is there a website we can go to? 
Uh, uh, well, you can go to my chef, uh, what is it, chefrush.com. Uh, it'll have everything on top of it with the nonprofit. Uh, of course, if you want to reach out, you can reach me at my real chef rush and just DM me if you have any questions as well. Or h- however, I'm, I'm all over the place, or I try to be. And like I said, again, I appreciate, appreciate any support, even if it's not in a monetary, even if it's just words of encouragement where I can reach out and give to the kids or to schools or organizations. And share that content you put out that's yeah, of course. so uplifting, right? Of course. All right. All right, before we go, I want you to finish the sentence for me. I'm a badass because... Because I'm Chef Rush. <laughs> what, what? <laughs> of course, no right? Well, I can say a lot of different things, but that's the <laughs> first thing that popped in my mind. But I'm a badass because I do 2,222 push ups, but that's the obvious. <laughs> or I got 24 inch biceps, or I can lift 700 pounds and run like lightning <laughs> and jump over a single building in one bound. You know, I could sit here and talk to you forever. Thank you so much for joining me. I, I really appreciate what you do what you represent. Uh, keep pumping out those uh, push-ups because you. uh, you're a guy who wears his heart on a sleeve. Literally, <laughs> apparently, at least in your case, big arms equals big heart. That's <laughs> there you, you go. my man. Thank you. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Pleasure.